there I was at camp, um, and for those of you who don't know, we went to camp in Oklahoma, and um, I was expecting for the kids to, you know, be blessed and to have their lives changed, but crazy God is so awesome, he changed mine too. So um, I called my parents, and I was like, I'm having such a great time. By the way, Dad, I want to preach on this. And he's like, all right, so well, what day? Do you want to preach the next Sunday? No, no, I don't want to preach the next Sunday. Give me a couple weeks to kind of in my head, and then, then we'll do it. So um, let me see. Um, Chantal, will you do me a huge favor from the crow's nest? Will you count how many people and then flash me how many people we have? Because I think I might have to make some copies. Okay. Um, okay. So we went to camp, and so this is their whole message. This is like, I'm going to give you five days worth of messages all in 25, 30 minutes. Um, so first, I'm going to go over a memory verse. And um, this is something, obviously, I'm used to teaching kids, so please bear with me if I seem a little childish. It's because I teach kids all the time. But um, you can understand. Okay, good. Okay, good. So our memory verse today is, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, for the saving of many lives. So I'm going to leave this up here because we are going to continue to kind of dissect this. First, we're going to talk about the first line, which is, you intended to harm me, and then we'll go on. Um, But something that we do in children's ministry is I have the kids repeat it back. I don't know about you, but um, reading things is cool, but when I read it out loud to myself, it sinks in my heart. Um, I'm sure that people in college, when they would pass my dorm room, would think I was crazy and talking to myself, but I actually did best if I pretended like I was teaching it to someone. When I became a teacher or when I was, um, you know, hearing it and speaking it, I learned it. So I'm going to make you today say it out loud with me. I'm not going to do like they did and have you shout it and then whisper it and shout it and then whisper it. We're not do that. Um, But we are going to to speak it out. So we're going to start. Here we go. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good for the saving of many lives. Genesis 50, 20. So obviously we know who the you is. um, And the but God, I put it big for a reason. And then we're going to move on. So let's start with... um, what this all kind of ties into. So our theme for camp was my life, his story. Hmm. My life, his story. Well, obviously the his is God or Jesus. Of course, they're all one and the same. Um, So my life, his story. Well, all of us are thinking we're all living our lives. We're all busy dealing with our lives and what we've got going, and nobody ever understands my life, and they're busy, but they aren't as busy as me, or, oh my gosh, I can't believe they didn't do that. Don't they understand I could do that plus 10 times better, or whatever. We all are stuck in ourselves. Um, It's something that um, I have termed me-ism. There's other people that do it too, obviously. There's books about it. But our whole society is all about me. It's me-ism. You go through a stop sign, and you get there, and you obviously were first, but that dude obviously thought he was first because he went. And you're like, what? And that's because it's all me-ism. So we all are wanting to deal with our life and our problems, but it's his story, or at least it's supposed to be. But I kind of realized I was doing my life my story, not my life his his story. So that we're going to go into some more today. Where does this one go? Maybe right there? Where do you think? Oh, perfect. Thank you, Pastor Peter. Okay, thank you. Chantal, did we have a count? 34. Okay, well then, (laughs) um, yes, will somebody go make copies of these? I need just four more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Okay, so in movies, there's always a problem, right? Every movie that you can think of, there's a problem. Um, For the kids, what they talked about was the movie Frozen. Hopefully, has anybody seen Frozen in here? At least most of you. Okay, good, because that's a really easy one to talk about. Um, So in the movie Frozen, which is there, it's it's a story of somebody's life. Um, Elsa has problems, and her problem is, is that she freezes everything to ice kind of big problem. The whole town is frozen to ice. The whole world is frozen to ice. There's a wind wind and snowstorm. Big problem. How was it changed? By love. Love 
calmed the storm. Love took all the ice away. Love of the friendship between the sisters. Love of loving each other. Love of loving their, their community. All changed the story. That's why I like that one because love is the reason. God is love. God changes our story. So when they were talking about your life is his story, I was like, okay, well, let me think about my story. What have I been writing on the pages of my story? So if you have a book, and obviously if we were, which the angels do, they write down every single thing we do. Um, so if I were to take my book that was supposed to be my story, what have I been writing in it? What have I been saying? So I thought about it, and I noticed that there was one big area of my life. First, when I was little, I wrote this word on my story. Shy. Am I shy? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, I am not shy at all. Um, however, people had hurt me in my life. Because people had hurt me, I had started to write shy. Because if people couldn't get to my core, if, they could, if I wouldn't let them in my circle, they weren't close enough to hurt me. So I wrote shy. If I had kept writing shy on the story of my life, would I be standing here? No. I wouldn't have done half the things in my life that God had planned for me to do. The devil intended to harm me. He was the one who wrote shy. God didn't write shy. God wrote bold, wild, crazy, but crazy for God in a good way. Um, that's what God was trying to write on my heart. But I was writing shy. There were things that I wanted to do in my high school years and my uh, middle school years that I wanted to do and should have done, but I decided I was shy. I decided that I couldn't or that, you know, no one would like me enough, so I didn't even try because I was hiding behind that. So one day, I finally decided, thank you, you can just leave them there for now. I decided to take that shyness, and I don't really know when I did. I mean, obviously, I did at some point, um, but I finally took the shyness, and I crumpled it up and put it in the God can because God can rewrite that. God can take over that. Then along comes my early 20s. And for those of you who have been here forever, you are totally knowing what's coming up next. Um, <laughs> for those of you who don't know me very well, you might be shocked by it because a lot of people that don't know, don't know. Um, but those of you who have been here for 20 or 30 years, you know. So I was going along in my life, and I thought everything was wonderful. I was dating this awesome guy. We got married, and I thought my life was going to be wonderful. And you know what? What happened? The devil intended to harm me. Guess what happened when I was 19 years old? This is what I started writing on every page. This was a big thing for me. I was a pastor's kid. I had done everything right in my life. I did not have sex before marriage. I did every. I did not party. I was like, God, how could you do this to me? This was big. I was so ashamed. I felt like, and I didn't feel that from anyone. I mean, nobody made me feel ashamed. My family and my church was so supportive. Many, many, many of you were here at that time. And that was really hard. And I kept writing this every year on my story for several years. I would introduce myself and tell people that I was divorced right up front so that then they could judge me and either like me then or not because I didn't want to deal with it. If, you got, if I let you in my circle and then you found out and then you judged me, that would kill me. So I wrote this. This was who I became. I became a divorced woman at 19. I took all that baggage, I took all those problems, and I heaped those on myself. I was no longer writing his story, I was writing mine. And you know what that does? Is when they, they talked about how your story starts with a problem. And this was my problem. This, is, this was big. 
And what happens to us is when we have these problems in our lives, we get so focused on them. It's all we see. Can any of you see my face? No. Can I see any of your faces? No. How can I be effective for God if I'm so focused on my problem? If I am looking at this problem always, I am never saving any lives with God's help. I'm never even saving my own life. I'm so stuck where the devil intended to harm me. I didn't make it to the but God. I stayed there. I stayed like this. So it wasn't until, I mean, I had so much support and so much love, and I went through something called freedom in Christ, and I forgave. I forgave God, even though God did nothing wrong. Um, I forgave myself. I forgave all kinds of things. Um, And obviously, I had to forgive my ex-husband for being who he was, but that's okay. Um, And I had to take that, and I had to put it in the God can. So then I kept, my life story kept going. I got married to the most wonderful man in the world. I had children. And now my life, I think I'm right and good. But every once in a while, I still have problems. Oh, shocker. Um, We all have problems. Um, So lately, I have been writing these two words on my story. And when I spoke a couple weeks ago when my parents were gone to Hawaii and I spoke on, um, remember I told you about the tree and how I had left the tree? So the Bible talks about how a tree, for those of you who aren't here, the Bible talks about how a tree planted near water is going to grow fruit and is going to reap and give others fruit and is going to be awesome because we're planted, the tree of life is next to the river of life and all that jazz. So I was like, you know, I had taken my tree and I had moved my tree away from the water and it was because I have been writing this on my life. Is this really a problem that I'm so busy that I feel like I'm coming and going and I'm meeting myself in the middle? And that I, from that busyness, I have created, uh, my, my spirit has been down. I have been weary. And that has been my problem. Many people have a lot bigger problems, much bigger. Um, but whether your problem is big or small to other people doesn't make it big or small in your life. These problems have been very big in my life. I have been being blinded by them. So going to camp and going and getting refreshed made a big difference to me um, because I started to realize I needed to take those problems and put them in the God can. So they had quite a few scriptures, and I'm going to share some of them with you um, because sometimes I think we forget, even though I teach these to my kids, Um, You have heard them a million times, but sometimes we forget how simplistic it really is. It really is the devil versus God. That's simple. Like, there's really all the mumbo-jumbo that people, you know, go through and all the, you know, things that, you know, somebody looked down on me once because I didn't go to seminary and I was a pastor and I was like, you know, whatever. You know, it's all about God, you know, God versus the devil. We're good. Simplistic. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his whole job. His whole job is to have us stop listening to God's story, start writing our problems in our book, and put our problems in our face and stop us from doing what God has intended us to do. God intended for me to be a pastor, for me to teach those children and to raise them up to be men and women of God. That's my job. I have been letting the devil steal, kill, and destroy that job. I can't, I cannot teach kids being shy. I have to be crazy and loud and wild, and I do weird voices, and they think I'm nuts, but they love me just as much as I love them. I love those kids. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He is coming to kill and steal and everything out of those kids' lives. But Jesus came that I may have life and life more abundantly. John 10, 10. Um, So that's the whole point. The whole point is that the devil is bad and God is good. And when we allow ourselves to focus on the negative 
if we're always talking junk about someone else, if we are always complaining and always whining, we are living here because that's what he does. Fear, something we talk about in our class, fear is the opposite of faith. Fear is faith in the devil. So when my kids come to me scared at night, I say, honey, are you in fear? Yes. Okay, then you're not trusting in Jesus. Is Jesus here? Yes. Are your angels in your room? Yes. Is mommy and daddy right here? Yes. Then what do you have to fear? Jesus is with you. There is no fear here. This is a no fear zone. You can be nervous about something, but there is no reason to fear. You are okay. And when we can figure that out, in our classroom we do something. Poor Mr. Pep, I make him be the devil all the time. Um, he goes out the door, and I say, okay, the devil is out there. And, oh, they, oh Oh, oh, that's okay. I don't mind. Um, so, oh, oh, and see all this, all this excitement. Um, so the devil is out there, and when you are scared, you are opening the door to fear. So when you open the door to fear, the devil comes and comes into your life. But if you have faith, then you open the door to Jesus. So it's, it's an open door, and we're the ones that control that door. The door is either open to God and you have faith and trust in him or you shut the door to Jesus and you let the devil in and then the devil has room to go crazy. Um, let's see. What's next? If God is for me, who can be against me? How many people work with annoying people? How many people have annoying people in their family? <laughs> not me. I'm not raising my hand for that. Um, but in all areas, there are annoying people in our lives. And we feel like the devil has brought them to just annoy us. But if God is for me, who can be against me? No matter what people you come across in your life, no matter who is uh, bothering you or be being annoying to you or oppressing you, it doesn't matter. Because God is for you. You need to have faith and trust in those situations. And you need to have the hope of God. Because the hope of God is the one that is going to change the situation. It is not you doing anything. It is all about God. If God is for me, who can be against me? Even though we all know these, it really is cool. Really is awesome. The Lord delivers me from all my troubles. Psalms thirty four nineteen. We should, like, put this on our mirror. Every day there's a trouble that comes. We were talking about that. Both of you were talking all about my sermon this morning. Um, the Lord delivers me from all my troubles. Uh, each of us has a trouble. But God. But God. So we're going to get to more of my story in a little bit. So let me go back to my, my notes here because we're done with scriptures for a minute. I have more, but we'll talk to those in a minute. So, oh, Wait. So a couple weeks ago, I did pray, and I did take this, and I'm working on the joy of the Lord is my strength. The Lord is the strength of my life. Okay. Um, all right, so I talked about that. Let's see. Hold on just a second. Um, yep, 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 yep. Yep, 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 yep. Oh, my goodness. I'm going very fast here. Um, okay. Yep, I did that. Okay. So, all right, so let's talk a little bit more about this. All right, so... Um, you intended to harm me, that was the devil part, but God intended it for good. So in this, in my story, do you think God wanted me to get divorced? No. It wasn't God's best. It wasn't what God wanted. God didn't destine me to be divorced at 19 years old. That's not, that wasn't his best. But it happened. But God intended it for good. God took that bad thing and made it into something good. In my story, about five years, five or six years later, I started working at a drug and alcohol rehab. That was not anything that I had ever thought that I would ever do. Um, I had no experience. I have never even smoked a cigarette. 
I have maybe had five drinks in my life and I didn't even finish a one. I think they're disgusting. Um, so it, it, drug and alcohol rehab was really not the place for me. Um, I was a case manager. I worked with these women every day. They were homeless women, which the homeless part I could understand God working with. We used to have homeless ministries, and I've worked with homeless people since I was like five. Um, So I was okay with that, but I was like, okay, God, what do you have for me? It was amazing what God did. I loved working there. I loved working with those women and encouraging them and telling them, you can do it. Well, but Tara, you don't understand. You're right. I don't understand. But you don't understand where I've been either. Every single one of us has things that we go across and we go through, but God. God gives us the strength to get through it. He gives us whatever tools we need to get through the problems that we are writing on our page so that we can turn the page and start a new page. He gives us the strength to tear off those pages and throw it in the can. There are many, many of those girls that have still kept in contact with me, and they write me, and they say, Tara, you were such a blessing. I don't take credit for that. That was all God. But if I hadn't have gone through a hard time in my life, if I hadn't have been at a point where I was so broken and I was so devastated, If I had not gotten to the point of considering suicide, I would never have been able to minister to others who were at that point, who were that low, who had gotten to that dark place. They would never have known that I'd been there until I opened my mouth and said, I've been there. And look at me now. I have a wonderful husband. I have a wonderful daughter. We live in a nice house. I'm okay. And it's only through God that I got there. So, but God intended it for good, for the saving of many lives. I didn't save them, but Jesus did. I had to, Matthew 5, 16 is my favorite scripture. It says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. It's not me doing nothing. It's the light of God shining through me. That affects others. But you have to open your mouth. The other day in class, I drew a big mouth. And I said, how will others know that you are Christian? How can you affect anyone else until you open your mouth? Do your coworkers know you're Christian? Does your family know that you're Christian? Do you wreak God? Do Do people look at you differently? They should. And if they don't, start shining. Get that light shining because he needs, he needs to shine through somebody. All right. Almost done. Oh, good. We're going to do great today. I'm so excited. Um, okay. So, um, so um, going off that, so I'm going to share with you a, um, a testimony of Willie George. Does anybody know who he is? I mean, okay. So, the story starts with a little boy and his older brother, and their dad is a rodeo dude. So, he goes on the rodeo circuit, and he and his little brother, their older brother, they're happy. Things are doing well, and mom starts drinking. Dad's always gone. All of a sudden, the marriage falls apart. The mom takes the kids, and they live in this little itty-bitty town of, like, 200. Everybody knows everyone. Everything's safe, happy. So at about eight years old or so, Willie and his brother, they move to the city with the mom. The mom's drinking increases. They never see the dad. The mom starts bringing in all kinds of men for who knows what. And their lives become hell. At age 14... Willie starts drinking, starts getting in with the wrong crowd because obviously his mom is drinking, so why doesn't he join the party? Um, And he starts partying, and his whole life is spiraling out of control. The devil intended to harm him. The devil knew who Willie George was going to be, and he did not want that. Lo and behold, last years of high school, Willie George gets invited to church, 
turns his life around and dedicates his life. He takes all those, I mean, I'm sure there was awful abuse, drug abuse. I mean, who knows what was going on in his life. He was writing those pages on his story. He tore that story up. He threw it into the God can, and God took that story and changed it. Willie George then started pastoring children's ministries. He then grew to where now he is the pastor of a church in Tulsa that has anywhere from nine to 12,000 people a week at his several different campuses. Not only that, but the children's camp that we went to is his camp. Thousands of children every year go to his camp and have their lives changed. If the devil would have gotten to him, look at how many people's lives would have been changed. How many people's lives are changed because you didn't say something? How many people's lives are affected because you may or may not be where God has you? God has a plan and a destiny for each of us. Maybe there is only one person that we're supposed to reach. But if we don't reach that one person, what are we going to tell God when we get there? What are we going to say when we are standing there in front of the Most High and he said, I gave you one job. Did you do it? Well, God, I was so busy with my problem. I had my problem right here. That's all I could see. Don't you understand? I'm not God, so I don't know what he's going to say. But um, hopefully he has grace, and I'm sure he does. But what are you going to say? It was really tough for me when I thought, started to think about that. What am I going to say? And I think over, and no matter, I mean, I'm still doing good, and I'm trying, but go ahead. Do you guys need to go to your church? Have a blessed service. I will see you guys soon. Um, so I was thinking about, you know, God, I'm trying. I'm a, I'm a children's pastor, and I, I volunteer at my kid's school, and I help raise money for this, and I do this. And still, God has more for me. There are still people in my life that I haven't shared with. There are still areas of my life that I can do better because I'm not putting God first. When I continue to put God first, all those other things will work out. All that stress and things that I've got going on. I mean, you guys know me. I'm here, there, and yonder all the time. It will all work out when I focus on him. When I focus, it all works. So um, there was somewhere I was going with this, and I just lost it. I don't know. Let me go over these real quick, and then we're going to get ready to do our papers because I really want to kind of bring this all home. So my, uh, I have two more scriptures that just really touched me that I really wanted to share. Even though I know them all, and I know you know them all, it still is good. Um, I cast all my cares on the Lord because he cares for me. Sometimes when we really think about that God is the creator of all the universe, that he created every solar system, every body in us, every cell, every structure, when you do science and you understand how amazing our bodies are, to think that that God who is so intricate could actually care about me, it's pretty crazy. Like, he actually cares about me. He cares that I, you know, stub my toe or, you know, I lost my wedding ring once and I put it on Facebook that I was praying and praying and I prayed for a day and finally something hit me and the Lord said, look here. And I, it was a, I looked everywhere. I even made Pep go through the trash with maggots. And it was awful. <laughs> Poor guy. And I looked, and there it was. I posted it on Facebook, and I had someone hugely rant, God does not care about you and your wedding ring. God could care less about your little problem. But the Lord says right there. He says right there, he cares about me. If it's a big deal to me, it's a big deal to God. If any of you are parents or you have a parent, which obviously we all do, but um, if your child was upset about something, don't you become upset about it? If your child is upset and this person did this to mommy, to me, mommy, and <gasps> you are going to march right over there and you're going to tell them what for? Because you care. You care about your child. If we are God's children, he's going to care about us. 
And then last, with God, nothing is impossible. No matter what you are writing on your story, it is not impossible for God to take that and change it. Your, your story is nothing new under the sun. Many people have gone through it before, and they have either survived or died from it. And you have a choice. You can either survive through it, or you can die from it. And that's our choice. But God, but God wants us to survive through it. He wants us to get to the other side and give him praise, glory, and honor for being there through it. We all can make it. We all can do better on the other side and then share with others. Say, I've been there. I know what that feels like. I remember the pain, the, the struggle, the frustration, the anger. I've been there. Let me help you because God helped me through. He sent somebody to me, and you know what? I'm going to be that someone for you. But you can't do it until you open your mouth until you care enough for others as you care about yourself. If you're so focused here, you're not caring about nobody else but yourself. Because in a mirror, all you see is yourself. If this was a mirror, you're so focused on you and your problem, you can't see past the hurting person standing in front of you. We have, every single one of us here, have a problem. We all are hurting in some way. This is our safe place. This is the place that we can come alongside each other and we can encourage each other and tell each other, but God, but God can take you to a next, the next level. This is the place where we need to be open enough to share. Everybody knows me. I am an open book. You want to know all my problems? I will tell you, and I will tell you how God got me through it. I will tell you how I've been angry at this person and that person, but you know what? God is going to get me there. I may still be angry at them, and that's not right, but thank God I'm going to forgive them soon, and God's going to get me through it. <laughs> but I am honest enough to say that because I have been with others who aren't honest enough with themselves to see their own problems. I never want us to get to the point that we think are per we're perfect because we're not. Only Jesus is. And if you come into church and you feel like you feel like you're perfect, please shut off that. Be real. Be real with one another. Where else are we going to find true love than in God's house? And if you come in and you're wanting to be judgmental, leave it at the door. Because God does not want that in our churches. Many people say, oh, I don't want to go to church. It's a bunch of um, hypocrites. You're right. I am a hypocrite straight up. Every single one of us are. And until we realize that, until we stop judging one another, until we stop judging our churches, until we stop judging everything, God can't change people's lives. It's only when we open up ourselves enough and we say, here I am. This is who I am. Love me the way God loves me. Will true change happen? When I put on the eyes of Jesus and I have the compassion that God has, when I look at you as a hurting soul that needs God's love, that's when we're being used by God. When I look at you and I say, look at what she's wearing. I can't believe how rude she was to me. I tell my kids in church, maybe that rude kid at school needs you the most. You have no idea what they're going through at home. Maybe they are being beaten at home. Maybe they just lost their parents. Or maybe they're in foster care. You have no idea what's going on. But the first thing we think of is judgment. It's the first place we all go, all of us, me included. We all judge. But if God cares about us so much, loves us so much, without him, nothing, you know, everything's possible, then it's possible for us to change who we are and love one another the way we need to love. That was a total side note. There you go. Um, so what I'm going to do is have, thank you, Jason, I'm going to have you each have one of these, and we're going to take a couple minutes, um, 
And we are going to read through these. Oh, now that Pastor Peter's group left, we, we will have enough. I should have given some, them some of them. I'll have to email them because um, I want the kids to do it. I totally want the kids to do it. Um, so what you're going to do, we're going to take, take a moment, and I want you to think we have eight minutes until we need to be done. So that gives plenty of time. The first box is the problem I am facing in my life right now. And believe me, you're going to take these home. So if you want to cheat and not write it down, that's fine. I'm not reading these. I'm not grading these. These are for you. <laughs> um, but I want us to do some self-reflection. The first one is the problem I am facing in my life right now is every single one of us have something that we're going on. Not a single one of us has a perfect life, but Jesus. So in that first box, you're going to write the problem. And then right there, I have God makes impossible things possible. I am throwing my impossible situation in the God can. Later, if you want, if it makes you feel better to crumple that thing, tear it up, and throw it in the God can, you go right ahead. I'm just going to leave it here. Um, something that I have done in youth ministries before is actually take the problem and burn it. You have no idea how releasing that is. Um, we did it at a Christian camp once. We wrote down all the people that we had not forgiven. We wrote down their names and what they did to us. We prayed, we forgave, and then we threw it in the fire to watch the, those papers crumble up and know that it is gone, and that God doesn't remember it anymore. I don't need to remember the pain anymore. I have forgiven them. It's very healthy. If you ever want to do it, do it at home. Get your little chimney up. Shh. It makes amazing things. So if you want to throw your impossible situation in the God can, go right ahead. You want to take it home, meditate, you can. Um, the next box is my impossible situation is... There's things in all of our lives that we are facing that without God, it is impossible. There's many things I could list now of all the things that seem impossible, but God, but God. The next box is, I am believing God will do this in my life to turn my situation for good. How can you imagine God doing it? God is obviously going to do it in his time and in his season. But God will, ch will take that situation and change it. The biggest thing you need to learn it with it is patience. Because God has a time and a season. And we may ask. His answer may be no, not right now. But we're still going to trust. We're still going to keep going. There's a song on the radio right now um, called Thy Will Be Done. If you haven't heard it, Google it. It's amazing. Um, and it's so true. In each situation that we're going through, obviously God didn't intend it. You know, God didn't want it. The devil intended to harm me. But God intended it for good for the saving of many lives. Thy will be done, God, in my life. I may be crying right now and I may not understand but I know you're here. Your will be done in my life. I know you're going to get me to the other side. I don't know when and I don't know how, but you will because I trust you. He will do that in your life. So I hope that you take some time and, and think about these. I hope that you really hear God's hope today because God is there for you. If God is for me, therefore who can be against me? God is good all the time and all the time, God is good. Thank you for listening to me today. It was very exciting to be up here. I had so much to share, and I, the kids all heard it. So this, the kids heard in, in like 10 minutes. So, um, you know, you can share with your kids, for those of you who have kids in my class, um, you can share with them, you know, and ask, you know, what problem did you write? The kids wrote the same things. Um, what problem did you write and what are you facing? Because as a parent, I want to be here with you. I want to go through these struggles with you. And I want to help lead you and guide you to God. So um, do you want me to pray in end service? Or what do you, what, what do, you do? Do you want me to just go sit down? <laughs> I, can, I can sit. So thank you. Do you want me? What, yes, I'll go sit down then. All right.
I'm ready to retire. <laughs> Glory to God. Well, after that, I think uh, several times a year we need to have you come and minister in here on Sunday mornings, okay? So let's just make it a uh, more often than not. But um, some powerful things were shared this morning. You know, Joseph didn't deserve to be practically killed by his brothers. He didn't deserve that. He didn't deserve to be sold into slavery. He didn't deserve to end up wrongfully accused and in jail for years. But God. But God through it, through it all kept him and raised him up. So just think of all of those things that you and I have gone through. God has kept us, and he can use those things for his glory. The point that she was trying to make is, don't get stuck. Don't let the devil stick you. Write those things down. If you want to this morning, after we close, put them in this God can. Or write it on toilet paper and flush it down the toilet. Send it down to the devil where he belongs, where he lives. <laughs> Amen. 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 <laughs> Praise God. Let's pray together. Father, we know that Jesus is touched with the feelings of our inadequacies, with the trouble and challenges that we face, we face in life. He's touched with those infirmities, those weaknesses, because he experienced life down here on this earth. But he overcame any and all of those things and did not sin. Even though we fall short of the glory, we're under him. So that's how you view us, Father in heaven. You view us as not a failure. But you see us through the blood of Jesus. Many of the things we've experienced in life are not our fault. But the devil tries to turn around and make us feel guilty and try to blame us for things. Now other things, yeah, we chose. We, we did make mistakes. In either circumstance, God, you're there with us. Those things that we've done wrong under the blood of Jesus... They're forgiven. And those things that were not our fault, just as a circumstance, just a situation that was out of our control. Lord, we learn to forgive ourselves and to forgive those that despitefully used us and abused us. So I speak a healing word over the hearts of people this morning. In the name of Jesus, let healing come. Get unstuck from those things. And begin to write his story in your life. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. That because of the words we've heard this morning, we're able to move forward because the kingdom of God is moving. It's not stagnant. But the kingdom of God is advancing to the glory of God. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen, amen. and amen. Praise God.